Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar with Batekio and Qt about how to seamlessly migrate Qt from an MPU to an MCU. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone who's registered. If you're watching this on demand, which I know a few of you will be um, if, at the end, um, anyone who's in the live, the live right now will be able to ask questions to our experts. And if you're watching this on demand, then you can always email us or um, put in the chat uh, hi, 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 Marcel in Munich. You can always um, email us or send us your questions and the experts can answer it later. Um, so I am Georgie Ryan Kasling. I am the head of marketing and head of partnerships for Wetechio. Um I'm here purely as your host and as someone who will ask the experts your questions at the end. So feel free to chat in the box and I will reply so that um, our speakers can, can do what they do best, which is to talk, obviously. Um, just a quick reminder that we're, we're very close to the QT World Summit, which is in Berlin on November 28th and 29th. Um, Wuteki will be at that summit, so you can actually meet Remy um, there if you're going, and he'll have a, a demo of, of what Wuteki has done on the Qt framework before. And I'm sure obviously Johan and the Qt team will be doing talks and lots of different subjects like the one today. Um, so for sure, if you're, if you're already in Berlin or if you're attending to go, let us know so that we can come and say hi. So today, the agenda obviously is is roughly what we're going to cover. It's talking about UI apps, uh, application tools for uh, widely varying hardware platforms from Qt, MPU to MCU with Qt success stories, how to leverage Qt for both MPU and MCU environments, expectations and challenges when transitioning, a live demonstration of QML application porting through Remy, and then our expert tips and tricks for successful migration. So that's exactly what we're going to be covering and probably a few more little spicy bits as well. Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Remy to introduce himself and then he'll yeah. hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm uh, Remy Roux. I'm the application team lead in WTQO. And I'm here today because uh, my team and I are software specialists and we are creating uh, high-end application and UI uh, for our partners. And we are used uh, to work with the Qt framework, but we are mainly working with MPU right now. And we want to talk about how to switch uh, to the MCU world. And to you, Johan. Thanks, Amy. Hello, everyone. So my name is uh, Johan Lopez. I'm a senior product manager at the Qt group. Uh, responsible specifically for offering on microcontrollers. Um, yeah, so today I will be explaining a bit uh, what do we provide to help development teams to work with microcontrollers in addition to microprocessor, as well as give a few examples of real life, uh, some of our customers, uh, what they have done uh, in, in this context. Right, so I'll, I'll start then uh, with a very brief uh, introduction about the, the Qt group. Um, maybe not of all of you uh, know uh, the company. So we've been around for, for quite some time already, more than 25 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have millions of users around the world uh, using the Qt uh, library and tools and more several thousand customers in, in, in many different industries. Uh, as a, you might also know Qt as an open source, of course, project, but there is a compa company behind it as well, where today more than 700 uh, people working worldwide and growing very fast, as you can see here, uh, last year, I think 28%. So to continue making Qt an, an ever better product. And we are really focusing on enabling agile enterprises by providing more and more libraries and tools that cover all the main steps, I would say, of uh, software creation from design to development to quality assurance and also uh, to management. So with, the, again, the core QT libraries, of course, but also tools like Squish for testing or new tools like Qt Insight, for example, to help track uh, the usage of the device that you deploy uh, on the field. So now let's dig into the, the subject of today. So microcontroller and microprocessors. Um, 
I, I hope you're all somewhat familiar with what the difference is between MCUs and MPUs, so MCU microcontroller and MPU microprocessor. There are some really, really important differences, and I don't want to give uh, uh, or spend too much time on the differences, but let's say that historically and traditionally, they, are, they have been fairly separate, solving each fairly different problems, but not really much uh, overlapping. But I think this is, at least recently, somewhat changing. Uh, and if we consider graphics application that, of course, Qt being mostly known as a graphics UI development framework, if we look at this specifically, we have today uh, more and more new high-performance microcontrollers that are actually very capable for graphics, and even in some cases better than some microprocessors. Uh, in parallel to that, uh, we have uh, we know that microcontrollers can be actually easier uh, easier to use than a microprocessor due to their simplicity mostly, but also they have a set of unique advantages that I will detail a bit in the next slide. But overall, uh, basically, um, it it has become now a fact that for some types of applications and some types of devices uh, where Previously, and, and several years ago, MPs would always have been used and always have been the, the, the choice. Uh, there are now cases where microcontrollers can be a better choice. So what are some of the advantages uh, or unique advantages of, of a microcontroller over an MPU? The first one I've listed here is real-time processing. Uh, again, due to the simplicity mainly of microcontrollers, um, it, it can be a better option than microprocessor, um, for example, simply because uh, latency can be lower, for example. So it, it's, uh, it can be a better option to make sure that tasks done by the device are, are done, let's say, on time. The second one would be power consumption. Typically, a microcontroller um, uh, uses less power than a, a microprocessor. So for devices, for example, powered by a battery, uh, it can be a better choice. And related to that, now we have also thermal management. Uh, due to the lower power consumption, typically an MCU will uh, produce less heat. And therefore, the overall design is simpler as there doesn't need to be complex uh, thermal dissipation uh, uh, like methods. Um, then we have the boot time, uh, especially when there's a human machine interface on the device. It is most of the time essential that uh, when the device starts up, uh, that the user must be able, uh, he must be able to, to interact with it as quickly as possible. And uh, this can often be a, a very difficult challenge on MP to make sure that the device boots as fast as possible. With microcontroller, again, this is typically much simpler. Uh, again, always due to one fact that MCUs, the software and the hardware are much simpler. And last but not least, uh, the cost obviously is uh, most of the time, again, lower with an MCU. It's not just the MCU itself, it's also the overall hardware around it. For example, memory, uh, you will often not have external memories or at least RAM with an MCU and other components that you might not need either. So yeah, these are essentially a high level summary of why today you might want an MCU over an MPU. Um, but then where we come into play here at Qt is making this simpler and easier um, because in a context of a company creating um, multiple devices at different price points, you might have teams that uh, need to develop in essentially a unified user experience, but across very different types of hardware, as I said, MCU and MPU, for example, uh, but also operating systems, and, uh, and even in some cases also mobile with mobile compa companions, for example. And uh, making sure that there is a uh, homogeneous uh, user experience across all these devices and maintaining it in the same way uh, can be very costly again. So at Qt, we're uh, creating again tools and libraries to enable having a common workflow and reusing code as much as possible across these very different types of 
devices. So let's have a look now at, um, well, so some of the prerequisites uh, when considering graphical user interfaces on MCUs. It's not just, uh, even though I said they are getting closer and closer in terms of power and capabilities, uh, in, or at least there's an overlap, uh, there are certain things to be aware of. You cannot just uh, go from MPU to an MCU without considering these. So the first one would be the resolution, the display resolution. Um, even with the increased power, they're still, let's say, typically not adequate for very high resolutions. So uh, what we see today most of the time is that uh, a, a display resolution would be between 320 by 240 up to 1280 by 720. Uh, but there are even today now starting to appear some, some very high performance MCUs that can even drive up to full HD display. But again, that remains an exception more than the rule. Uh, but again, if you really need high resolution, chances that uh, you, there might not be an MCU that can solve this problem. Um, then 3D, again, we see 3D more and more in all kinds of user interfaces on devices. And Qt in general, by the way, of course, can help with that. But on MCUs, uh, this is typically not really doable, at least not real time. Uh, there's just no hardware acceleration available on MCUs to do real time 3D. However, and I wanted to mention that it does not completely exclude some use cases. It is still possible, again, now, nowadays, to do pre-rendered 3D like image sequences. Uh, or even real-time 2.5D. Uh, so some MCUs today have GPUs or gra graphics processing units that can do 2.5D, which means for those of you not familiar with the concept, is to render, let's say, 2D objects like an image in the 3D space. So it's uh, kind of like 3D, but not really 3D. And finally, um, well, uh, generally, any kind of complex multi-process software architectures are not fit for uh, microcontrollers, are, uh, again, due to the nature of the hardware and what it can do. So uh, typically, a software would need to remain simple when it comes to its architecture. So a bit more concretely now, what, what does Qt actually offer here for MCUs? Um, because again, I'm, I'm assuming many of you already know Qt, but you might not know what is called Qt for MCUs. It's uh, a new part of our, uh, let's say, libraries that we released now already uh, back in December 2019. So it's not entirely uh, new. But essentially, it's about bringing some of the core technologies and tools from Qt also on MCUs. We have already been supporting desktop, mobile, web, MPUs for a long time, but we were still missing this last piece of the puzzle, which is MCU. Um, so the, the key, really key technology of Qt at the core of pretty much everything is Qt Quick and the language that goes with it, the QML language. So we took these two core parts and adapted them also for MCUs or more generally resource constrained systems so that it's much smaller and more adapted to, to, to these systems. And at the same time, we kept the tools that are known by all Qt developers, uh, Design Studio and Qt Creator that offer uh, again, similar um, development environment for creating Qt applications. And here I've, I've, I've summarized some of the key features of the engine behind all of this, uh, basically the engine for QML on microcontrollers, we call it Qt Quick Ultralight. This is uh, in, in I'm going to call it Big Qt. <laughs> there is something called just Qt Quick in Qt for MCUs. There's Qt Quick Ultralight that basically indicates that it's a smaller version, but also a subset of the features we offer on our platforms. But here, it, it, it really just summarized some key aspects. So I would say uh, the, the most important of all is the size. Um, and you see here on the second item on the list, uh, Qt Quick Ultralight or a Qt application on MCU would uh, can require as, as little as 200 kilobytes of RAM. It can, of course, be larger depending on your requirements and your design, but it can be as low as that. If we compare this to a big Qt application, 
the minimum requirement would be typically closer to 10 megabytes. So it's it's really a significant difference. And and um, and so this quick ultralight uh, runtime is much more adapted to a typical MCU environment. There are other uh, things that basically covers all the important aspects of a graphics engine from font rendering to 2D shape to animation system and so on. Uh, this is all documented on our website. So if you're more curious, uh, curious about it, of course you can you can find more info on our website. Um, I wanted also here to give you a brief overview of the architecture because it's also if you're not familiar with the differences, it's it's it can be quite different. On an MCU, it's uh, on the left side. It's uh, it's pretty simple. It's typically a, a monolithic architecture where you have. Uh, everything built into a single binary where it contains the application code itself, of course, and the GUI code. Optionally, a real-time operating system. It's not always the case. And then the drivers, and then just the MCU. So it, it, it stays really simple. And Qt, in this context, it's a very important aspect, can run straight on top of the drivers. Therefore, it, it can run bare metal. However, on an MPU, um, it's it, looks a bit different. Uh, there's more layers, let's say, and a GUI application would uh, typically run on top of other middleware. It will never run directly on top of the OS kernel or the drivers or anything like that. Uh, and, and therefore, the big Qt always have dependencies on specific operating systems like Windows, like Linux, QNX, and others. Uh, so this is again a key difference. Uh, Qt Quick Ultralight does not have any OS dependency, uh, while Qt Big Qt for MPU has always an OS dependency. But uh, how typically, how can you actually in the end reuse, uh, uh, especially code between these two architecture being so different? Uh, it, it all comes down to the QML again. It's this common language uh, and approach to the GUI itself, and being a subset and being fully compatible, it is possible to create a common library of QML components that you can reuse on both types of devices and systems. So now um, I will give you a couple of examples uh, from, from our customers that we can share some information about. The first one is uh, Yang Feng Vision, one of our customers in, in, in China, an automotive tier one supplier for uh, different uh, different brands uh, locally. Uh, what's interesting here is that, uh, again, due to the rise of some more powerful MCUs, they uh, decided for some of their products, which is like entry-level uh, instrument clusters, as you see some examples on the right, uh, they have been so far always created these entry-level instrument clusters based on MPUs. Uh, because that was all that could really solve all of the requirements. But now, as I said at the beginning, due to, to the rise of these more powerful MCUs, they decided to take a leap, let's say, and, and really give a chance to a new platform that would be based on an M MCU to actually solve the exact same requirement, same display resolution, same kind of effects, screens, and so on, and, and do it on MCU instead with mainly, let's say, cost in mind, right? So really to reduce the overall cost of our platform. And independently from that, they had, of course, uh, cute developers because they were already working on MPU. And uh, the result was successful. Uh, there's not much I can share, but there are cars today based on this new platform. And they've been able to leverage all of their knowledge, uh, resources, and in some cases, even code that they already had done uh, on this new MCU platform. And then the second case uh, that I wanted to, to give you as an example is a bit different. Uh, this is uh, with uh, Hasselblad, uh, Swedish um, camera manufacturer. You might know it if you're, if you're uh, a photo, photography <laughs> enthusiast. Um, so they, they not too long ago released a new model that basically innovates in a way that the, the top level screen, you can see it on the right here of the picture. There, this is always on every camera, this kind of a small display that shows all kinds of information. But what they did is they wanted to go a bit further like in improving the experience. So having a color LCD with ability to display more information, but uh, they basically have been using Qt already on the bigger display in the back 
which is running on Linux and more complex system, but this was much simpler. And uh, it, it, it is basically running on an MCU and uh, they did not want to, you know, use a different toolkit, use a different uh, approach to this. So uh, in this case, they selected Qt for MCUs to also develop that part. And, and again, they were able to reuse their, uh, reuse the same workflow, reuse the same tools, reuse the same people to develop this as well. And they've done that successfully with the the, the, the device today available already for, for quite some time uh, on the market. And uh, that concludes my part. So th thank you for uh, for listening. And uh, I leave it to Remy, who will we'll explain a bit more in details concretely what it means here to, to do the switch. Sorry, Remy, we can't hear you. Um... Yeah, let's try like that. There you okay. go. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Johan. So uh, as you said, uh, there is a new product, uh, Qt for MCU. Uh, not that new, but uh, and the MCU market uh, is now changing. Uh, the MCU are more and more powerful. So the goal here is to outwindle uh, this technology switch. Uh, in WTQ, we saw two approaches. Uh, either you take someone with a lot of MCU knowledge and you teach him how to create applications, uh, or you take someone with all the application knowledge, uh, knowing how to build intuitive UIs, and you teach him the MCU world, uh, more or less. Uh, and the results uh, were quite funny. Uh, actually, the team uh, on the MCU part, uh, everyone almost ended up with some PTSD uh, by creating UI, I mean, not using the Qt for MCU framework, uh, because, you know, placing uh, items on the screen pixel perfect or changing only the, the color or really taking care of the user experience is not uh, that uh, easy. Uh, and the result uh, with uh, using my team was, let's say, way better. And we really enjoyed the, the trip. Um, well, I'm glad you not all have PTSD now. That's good. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, I can reassure you, uh, right now they are working on drivers and they are making LED blinks. So they are really, really happy. Um, so uh, just a, a disclaimer, uh, the team and I, we had really no knowledge about the MC world before this, uh, uh, this dive, uh, let's say. Uh, so my first fear was about the developer environment. Uh, I'm really seeing, I was seeing the MCU world as something old, uh, only using C, you know, and uh, if you need to uh, uh, display an images, you, you will have to light every pixel uh, by end. Uh, so I wanted to really see uh, what can translate from one of our classical projects. So here, uh, I just listed uh, every tool uh, that we can use in, in one of our projects. Uh, and I want to mention also uh, the environment uh, because uh, it's really something that we want to have quality work, uh, it being able to run uh, our code both on the target and on the desktop. Uh, and the differences uh, actually were uh, really limited. Uh, when we switched uh, into the MC world, uh, everything was there. Uh, the ideas, uh, we are using all the CMake to handle the build and the packaging process too. Uh, the main differences was where to get uh, the compiler for your target, uh, because we are used to the Yocto project generating us everything. Here, it's not the case, obviously. Uh, we are also using containers. So everything uh, from a modern uh, development standpoint is available. So it was really a good, uh, <laughs> I was wrong. Uh, so it, it, was a, it was really good news. Uh, the only thing I want to mention here too is that uh, we didn't have the backend uh, running on the desktop. Uh, not that it's not feasible, but it implies a lot more uh, stubbing work uh, because the architecture between your desktop and the MCU is way different than when you are working with a Linux and uh, some embedded Linux solution. Uh, so it's possible, but we didn't take the time to explore this uh, option. Uh, so now, uh, with everything set up, we could try our first uh, code uh, using uh, the Qt uh, for MCU uh, framework. Uh, we reused uh, some uh, 
classical solution uh, that you can find. Uh, it's actually some code that uh, the Qt group uh, gives you. Gives you. You can either follow the link here, or if you have Qt Creator installed on your uh, on your desktop, you just uh, go to the tab and you you will be able to set up everything. Uh, the conversion was made uh, using Qt 6.6, and uh, we uh, we made it uh, to the Qt for MCU 2.5. Uh, why? Uh, do we use this uh, this uh, example? Is because it's a simple uh, QML based application. There is no backend. There is no C++. So we can uh, see every feature uh, on the QML side of the application. Uh, the conversion was really straightforward. Uh, it requires some work. We will see it uh, just uh, just later. Uh, but everything uh, was really simple. Uh, the main work was on the CMake part uh, of the application. And when uh, we sorted that out, uh, the uh, main strategy was just to run the code, uh, see where we need to modify something, and run the code again until it's working. And it took us really no time at all to have this working. Right now, I can show you. I will share my screen uh, some the, this example, it will be running uh, on my uh, on my desktop. Let's go. Okay. Uh, so here uh, we are inside Qt Creator. Uh, here I'm selecting uh, the desktop uh, solution. Uh, so without any of our work, I'm just launching it. Afterwards, I'm modifying here. I'm just uh, pointing to uh, the other solution. Uh, we are using the Qt for MCU uh, uh, kit. Now I'm launching it too. And as you can see, it's uh, really, okay, let's make this one. Let's make this one. It's really, it's about the same. Uh, if we are looking at it, uh, what's uh, different? Uh, the name of the windows, yeah, okay. Uh, let's say I'm selecting an espresso and here I'm selecting an espresso too. Here, uh, we can see that the sugar uh, is not rotated. It's something that it's missing at the moment. There is not uh, no element to do some rotation on your element, but you can easily implement something on your, um, yourself, let's say. Uh, afterwards, we can see there is a small differences too in how uh, the solution under the font. Uh, but uh, once again, it's no big deal. Uh, here, we have some differences on the sliders, but it just need to have some customization and some, uh, uh, some, yeah, some, some a new style sheet, but everything will be working uh, as is. And when we can, uh, when we do the, the drawing, uh, we have uh, the same animation also. Uh, so it's just to show you uh, how easy it was to have something that is really similar. Uh, when I say uh, it's easy, so it's straightforward, but it requires a lot of modification. Uh, on our side here, it's just uh, some differences uh, between the different files. Uh, here we can see we had to rewrite uh, some part of the uh, of the UI. Uh, and what I wanted to show it's here, uh, we had to use uh, other uh, type of element uh, because they are not uh, in the Qt Ultralight framework yet. Uh, here we have the use of anchors instead of using a layout uh, as we are used to. Uh, okay, uh, I think it's enough uh, for this uh, little uh, share and we will go back to the, to the presentation. Uh, here, okay, it's uh, everything we saw. Uh, I won't go uh, in uh, every uh, little column. You, you can uh, look at it afterwards if you, if you want. But it's just to say that most of the features uh, presented in Qt Quick are really similar in Qt Ultrite. It was really simple. Uh, and every time uh, we hit some problem, uh, we had a fallback strategy that took no time to implement. Uh, here, it's another example of an application. Uh, it's way more complex. Uh, it's an EV charging station. Uh, and the goal is to show you um, the differences uh, between the C++ and the QML interfaces. Uh, the C++ API is different uh, from what we are used to in the Qt QML, uh, but it's actually simpler. So it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, and we will just 
C, uh, how to create C++ models and how to, cre to create C++ backend singleton uh, to share data uh, across your application and how we dealt with uh, this problem. Uh, so here uh, is just an example of the C++ model. On the left, uh, you have the one in uh, the Qt Quick version, and on the right, uh, the one in the Qt Ultralight. Uh, so if you are familiar uh, with how the Qt Quick is working, uh, you are seeing uh, the uh, really used ma macro Q property, which declares uh, uh, an element that you will be able to see and display on the on the screen and everything uh, on the right of the crew property enables to modify, uh, to uh, see the, the modification go live uh, and everything, all this part is handled with only one link in the Qt Ultralight, uh, one line, sorry, in the Qt Ultralight uh, version. Uh, for the as for the C++ singletons, those ones are to export uh, behaviors, uh, not only uh, the visual data like the model, uh, and you want to have it all across your application uh, to be able to display everything. Uh, this part has also been simplified. Uh, so once again, uh, you have an example on the right. And uh, as you can see, uh, you have also to be a bit familiar with the Qt Quick uh, 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 keyword, let's say. When, to, when you want to have a, an enum uh, being transferred uh, all over your application, uh, you need to have several macro uh, to, uh, to be able to, the metadata system uh, will need to, those macro to understand uh, the data behind uh, the, the enum. Uh, here, uh, just one keyword, uh, enum, and everything is handled for you. Uh, so once again, uh, for the, uh, the developer side, uh, it's really, uh, it's uh, some time saved, uh, let's say, and everything is possible uh, because actually uh, in the Qt Ultralight version, uh, the code is converted in C++. So yeah, the interfacing is uh, really easier that way. Uh, some remarks uh, that we got when we we just uh, looked at everything in the Qt Ultralight code. Uh, so uh, it's a subset, uh, as uh, as we said, uh, of the Qt Quick uh, environment. Uh, but we are really seeing it growing uh, rapidly. Uh, so it's re it's really great. Uh, we are uh, we need to think a little bit. Uh, uh, differently uh, as we we have other solutions to implement. Uh, and we also need to uh, sometimes implement custom solution, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's also part of the fun. Uh, yeah, uh, this one, it's almost uh, as we just saw. Uh, it's an example uh, of uh, a control uh, specific ones. Uh, on the left, you have the version with Qt Quick. On the right, the version uh, in Qt Ultralight. And it's just the same. Uh, the layout are not here, so we have to use the anchors. Uh, the text are not uh, the end of the same way, so we had to modify that. And we are not uh, using a bounding value for the margins to spare some resources. I just want to point out, sorry, Remy, because um, I'm on your screens, the people who are watching, obviously yeah. it might look small, that everyone will get the slides afterwards. So yeah. you'll be able to exactly. zoom in and see the beautiful code yourself. So it's fine. Yeah. OK. Uh, and one last example uh, is a custom uh, control that we created. Uh, we are used to do that uh, also with the Qt Quick. Uh, usually uh, extending the Qt Quick item and uh, using the same graph API, uh, but this is not, uh, it doesn't exist in the MCU world, but you have access directly to the frame buffer. Uh, so if you remember, uh, I said I saw the MCU world where you light every pixel uh, from a specific color by end. Uh, yeah, I, I was not that wrong uh, because here it's what we did. Uh, we wanted to have a, a gradient uh, for this uh, uh, char charging bar. Um, so we extended the painted item uh, using the Qltralight uh, type uh, to be able to really uh, handle a gradient when the, the, the bar is growing. 
once again, yeah, you, you will have some time to look at that, but it's just the implementation uh, that we did uh, to, to be able to have, a, you, you don't have to trust uh, just what I said, uh, you can run it at home and you will see uh, how it works. Okay, uh, so now, uh, some uh, some thoughts, uh, let's say. The first one is how to write um, uh, Qltralight application that are compatible with Qt Quick. Uh, the naive approach is, is to say, yeah, I can limit uh, everything I am doing on my Qt Quick uh, application, uh, and that way, uh, everything I develop it only once, and uh, it will be working, uh, and you you will have everything uh, running on the MPU and the MCU. However, uh, you will miss out on a lot of functionalities uh, that are really great on the Qt Quick side. Uh, so it's not really uh, the approach that we want to push. Maybe we can, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, another uh, thought is that uh, if you already have some MPU code source, uh, you can uh, migrate everything to the Qt Ultralight. It's not difficult uh, as we saw but it might require some time and efforts because uh, you have to rewrite uh, all part of the code so it's a solution uh, but uh, we, we have to be aware that there is a cost uh, so the best thing uh, we, we think is to start uh, writing an application uh, in the cute ultralight world and when it's needed when you want to add a specific uh, functionalities for your MPU uh, version of the application, extend it and write some specific code for your MPU. Uh, and the three uh, uh, bullet points left are more like if you are like us uh, uh, coming from the AP MPU world, uh, you know that you must be uh, careful with the resources, but yeah, it's even true in the MCU. Uh, world, uh, so be careful when you are using images, when you are uh, when you want 200 plus uh, screens for your application, it's maybe not uh, a good idea. And so, yeah, the final word, uh, it was really fun and great to work with the, this, uh, this tool. Uh, it was really uh, interesting to see that uh, knowing uh, the Qt Quick world, it, it was really easy uh, to go into the Qt Ultrite. I think it's really the goal and it, it works uh, just. Um, and the subset of control we used, uh, everything uh, was working uh, wonders. Uh, the, the tool is production ready, the, the, we, we saw it. So uh, yeah, uh, um, we had sometimes uh, some uh, um, things that we uh, carry from the uh, MPU world is not working uh, in the same way uh, on the MCU. So. Uh, Obviously, we had to relearn something, but it was really light. And yeah, uh, one last thing, uh, as usual, uh, the documentation, the community, and everything you can find uh, on the Qt uh, resources, uh, everything is of great quality. So it was really easy uh, if we had questions. Uh, so my only hope is that we can find some uh, partners to now uh, do a real project uh, with, uh, with this kind of technology. Amazing. Thank you so much, Remy and Johan. Gleaming review from you at the end there, Remy. That must be nice to hear, Johan. Remy's like, it's brilliant. I love it as a software guy. That's perfect. You're happy to hear, for sure. <laughs> exactly. Um, as I said, and I'll say it again, uh, for anyone who is like, I want those slides, I need to look at them in more detail, they will be sent out after this. Um, does anyone have any questions? I can see a few now, so I will start asking them. Um, I think this relates to more towards the beginning, Remy, when you were talking about the sugar cubes and how they didn't like rotate and how you had to do a, a few things. Um, our friend from Munich asks, those uh, styling issues, does the tool chain for QR, QUL generate any warnings, build slash runtime ones? No, uh, because it's not really um, a warning. If we are really uh, talking about the cube, um, uh, it, it depends. Okay, uh, if there is the rotation item, it, it won't uh, work uh, because uh, the the compilation uh, it will say that the element uh, is not recognized. Uh, uh, but uh, if you modify your code afterwards, it's just not uh, rotated because there is no rotation. So yeah. Yuan, do you have anything to add to that on cute side? 
Yeah, so when it comes to styling, maybe one element here to, to mention, to understand a bit also why is it different, is that Qt Quick Controls essentially comes with styles, right? You, If you use the Qt Quick Controls on BigQt, you know you have a selection of styles like Material, uh, Universal, uh, Basic, and some other ones. Basically, today in Qt Quick Ultralight, uh, none of these styles exist. We have one unique built-in style, uh, which does not look exactly the same. So but that's why it looks different. So, but in, uh, I would say, um, real life application, you would have, of course, your own style. So if you need one style on MCU and MPU, you would create your own custom one that would look basically the same on MCU and MPU. But uh, the default one, uh, yeah, the, there today are no com commonality between them. Um, yep. Okay, perfect. Well, we've had a, a comment saying that it's understood you explained it well so that's great um we've got another question thank you for the workshop that's okay thank you for being here um what other requirements to mcus and the code eg which real-time operating system drivers to access screen to use uh cute ultralight i can put it on the screen if you'd like to see it so that you can there you go so you can read it yourself because i know sometimes context is key can take this one maybe um so uh, the requirements are actually very simple for Qt for mcus it's it's much less than uh, big cute um these are documented by the way maybe i'm not sure if i can put a link somewhere here but if i can i will <laughs> later on uh but um essentially on the artist level there is no requirements you just you can run bare metal so it's fully optional there's zero dependency um as for the display, essentially, all the only thing you would need as a prerequisite is a display driver. That is all. I mean, we do not provide a display driver uh, for all the platforms we support out of the box. We basically use the drivers that are provided by the vendors uh, for a given uh, MCU and development kit. Uh, if you adapt that to something else, the prerequisite would be that uh, you have a functional display driver that you can integrate together with Qt for MCUs. But that's essentially it. I mean, basically just a few drivers, depending on the features, for sure a display one, you might need a touch driver if you need touch. Um, and uh, I might be forgetting something, but I don't think so. That's essentially it. It's just a few drivers that you need to integrate. Okay, amazing. Yuan, if you send me the link when I send sure. out the slides, I'll include that, as well as the coffee demo that Remy used uh, that you saw. So I'll send everything out um, as, as part of the package. Um, Remy, is there anything you want to add to that or can we move on to the next question? No, nope. great. That's perfect. Amazing. Um, another question, uh, will it be possible in future to build an application, just one of them for both MCU and MPU without the need of migrating or porting. I think that's a device maker's dream, right? Just to build one for all. Yeah, uh, as you said, maybe it's a, a dream. Uh, at the moment, we can uh, almost do that. But once again, uh, the uh, targets are really different. And uh, even if the capability of the MCU are closer and closer, uh, it, it's not uh, in the same way. I mean, uh, when we are working on NPUs, we are integrating um, web browser, uh, we are using videos, we are using a lot of things that uh, really needs uh, powerful uh, hardware. And I'm not sure that it would, it's not soon that uh, DMCU will be able to, to do this kind of features. If I can add something here, I would say that um, it depends really on the use case. For simpler use cases, it is possible today on the graphic side to create basically the same application that works in both. But um, th there's one key difference that today makes it not possible to have fully the, the full application exactly the same between MCU and MC MPU is the mm -hmm. backend side. As you have seen, I think, from Remy. The APIs today are different, um, and also we do not today offer uh, what's known as Qt Core, for example, libraries. So, for example, for containers, for 
um, strings and all these things. So they do not exist. There's no equivalence. So of course, that means that you need to write this differently on MCU. So if you consider also the backend, then no, it is not exactly the same. However, again, this might change and evolve in the future. Uh, the, the vision generally, of course, is to offer as much as possible from Qt also on MCUs. Um, including all kinds of other uh, libraries from Qt, not just Qt Quick. So in the future, uh, this might be uh, let's say easier and easier to have one common cut base for MCU and MPU. But today, it remains mainly focused on the QML part and the GUI part. Yeah, um, I think that kind of answers this question as well, which I'm going to put up, which um, oh, let me add it. Which basically is saying, you know, what if I use the same code on on MPU as I did on MP MCU? But as you said, it it will need right. Yeah, in in this order, let's say if you start, and as Remy has said as well, I think at the end, uh, if you work, if you set up a workflow when you need to target both, where you actually create first the well as a subset, you should start with a subset, and and that will work just as is on MPU. There's no need to port anything. Uh, mm -hmm. It's for anything that's different that might need to be ported. But the, the common subset, if you can run it on MCU, you can also run it on MPU. Okay. That's good to know. Um, we have another one here. Uh, so how is performance of a QE application running on, on real-time operating systems? I could take this one. I don't know if, I mean, you've observed specific things in your case. But um, on, on my side, what I can say here, of course, this can vary widely depending on MCU itself, on the resolution, on the application. But generally, uh, let's say that some of the top tier MCUs today with graphics capabilities, and by that I mean acceleration for certain things, it is possible to drive um, um, actually up to a full HD at 60 FPS. It is actually possible on very specific MCUs. On some less capable one, you can do 60 FPS uh, during animations, but then uh, resolution would have to be limited to something smaller. Uh, typically, again, 800 by 480 or even lower. So it, it really depends. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a challenge, definitely. Often with graphics, you need to be very aware about what you're doing for performance. But let's just say 60 FPS is possible depending on the use case. And sometimes you need to implement a bit of tricks to make sure that in the end it does look good and that it performs well. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot to talk about potentially here, but it's uh, it's uh, just a general message. It is possible to actually very smooth applications as well on these. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I suppose the plug is obviously if you're using the cute tools to help you and then a services company like Watekio to do the rest, then then it's golden. We can do it. But that's the plug, and I'm not going to do it. Um, I've got a question here that came over email talking about how much flash memory does Qt for MCUs require? Right. So again, will vary on multiple parameters and and like uh, and depending on the context. But we um, we've observed based on multiple benchmarks, application demos, real life application that. A minimum for, let's say, a somewhat simple application would be 500 kilobytes of flash memory, so for the code. Uh, but of course, it can go any, anywhere higher depending on on on, on uh, what you're doing. But again, the average would be between 500 kilobytes and maybe 10 megabytes. That's fairly average depending on on the assets. So good range. Okay, another question here. Uh, could uh, Qt Ultralight application also run bare metals on the MCU in theory, or is an OS or a real-time operating system mandatory? Right. Yeah, I think that was also covered a bit earlier. So yeah, no, it can run bare metal. Uh, an OS on an RCOS is completely optional on MCUs. OK. If that is it, I cannot see any other questions. If anybody else has anything to ask, please get it in. Otherwise, otherwise that's it. Our, our experts are done. Um, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you to Johan and to Remy for spending your time to give all your, your knowledge and information to us. It's been really helpful. As I said, the slides and um, the links for, for the different um, tools and, and documentation that you need um, will, will come to you very shortly. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And thanks again to our speakers and have a lovely day.
Thanks, guys. Thanks, Remy. Thanks, Yoan. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.